Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining our diagnostic training session today. And what you're about to see is a pre-recorded training session we did over in the United States. Uh, but be assured that the a lot of the material that we cover is really applicable to any automotive applications. So uh, just be aware that, it, it, yes, it, it is a lot of North American vehicles, but they will apply a lot of the same principles apply over in the UK as well. Now, if you do have any questions, if you're watching this during the premiere, you can just uh, leave it in the chat. We'll be monitoring live chat. If you're watching this after the premiere, then just feel free to leave a comment underneath the video and we'll get to those as we can as well. So my name is Jason Gabrinas. I'm one of Snap-on's diagnostic technical trainers. I've been in the training department since 2013, traveling around North America, helping techs and shop owners get the most out of their diagnostic equipment. Before I did that, it was a couple of years as a diagnostic sales rep at Snap-on, so I had 30 different franchisees I worked with, as well as the shops that they serviced in order to help everyone get the most out of their diagnostic needs. Then before I did that, it was eight years at Subaru, so I worked in a dealership, and over time, I guess, just became the default dyad guy in the shop. So I always ended up having the drivability problems, the intermittent problems, the weird wiring problems that would show up on those cars. And that's really where I cut my diagnostic teeth, was trying to figure out all those weird head scratcher type cars that would come into my mind. Then before that, a bunch of other miscellaneous wrenching jobs, been a little over 25 years under hood experience for me. So our topic today is after the repair, reflashes. So if you've seen any of our past videos, we've had a kind of a series on this. So uh, the last final installment today will be reflashing. And sometimes, if you think about it, that might be the very last thing you need to do before you button up a vehicle and give it back to a customer. There's going to be certain times, of course, where you're going to need to do a flash or a reflash. But the other thing we need to think about is there is a lot of confusion in the industry as to what we mean by reflashing or flashing. Because there are a few different terms that get thrown around. Maybe not so much resets or relearns. Those are kind of a, a blanket term for some other things. But definitely those bottom three there, coding, programming, flashing, reflashing. A lot of these terms can be conflated and confused even among OEMs. Uh, so you as an end user could even have some confusion as to what they're actually talking about, what they actually mean. So I'm going to define these terms here just real quick before we get to the actual flashing part of the uh, of the presentation here but it's good to understand the differences between these so first off is resets and resets is probably the simplest easiest thing to do uh, it's a bi-directional control for lack of a better term so resets are used to reset a parameter back to factory specifications for example oxygen sensor heater on some vehicles oxygen sensor heater learns over time that it needs to increase the amount of current flow through the heater circuit in order for it to get up to temp at the same speed as it used to when it was new. Uh, so it learns that over time and increases the amount of current. Once I replace that oxygen sensor for whatever reason, I'm going to need to reset that current level back down to factory spec or I'm going to burn out the new sensor that I replace it with. So that's just one example, reset that. Or uh, transmission shift adapters. Most modern transmissions have a way of learning how you drive. So if you drive a little more gentle, it'll shift a little more gently. If it's if you're a bit more of an aggressive driver, maybe it holds on to that shift a little bit longer until it shifts. And if I do any work on the transmission, even so much as changing the fluid sometimes, I have to reset those adaptives. Otherwise, the vehicle is not going to shift the way the customer would be expecting it to. So that's just another thing to reset. So it's just a simple switch up on the top of the screen here. This is the on an oxygen sensor heater learn on our tried and true there Tahoe. But if I hit reset, boom, it's done. It resets. So resets, like I said, the most simple task that we would have to do. Next one's going to be relearns. So those are a little more complex. Uh, sometimes you might have to read a little bit more, follow a few more steps and make sure that, that the parameters are where they need to be while I'm doing that. So a relearn, by definition, would be to use to teach the ECM parameters of a replacement part. So it's relearning the parameters of the part. Uh, example, a throttle body learn. If you so much as unplug a throttle body on some vehicles for diagnostic purposes or even cleaning the throttle plate, uh, you have to do a relearn so the vehicle can relearn where's zero, where's 100%, and what's in between. What's, what is the range of motion 
on this throttle plate. Otherwise, you hit, you know, if you don't do it, maybe you're at 100% throttle and it only opens at 95%, something like that. Uh, so the vehicle needs to know, the module needs to understand where the range of motion is. Valve body relearn, very similar to what we just talked about, a reset, but a, that might actually fire the solenoids in the valve body and things like that. And then TPMS, right? tire pressure monitor. I have to go around and teach the vehicle where each tire is in the what corner of the car the tire is. So we need to do that every time we rotate a tire. Also important to note when it comes to a relearn is we need to follow the steps exactly as the manufacturer lays them out. And that is going to carry through through our reflashing as well. You need to make sure you follow all the instructions, make sure all of the parameters are met. Because if the, the, like it says here, learning will be canceled if any of the following conditions are missed for even a moment. Battery voltage, coolant temperature, et cetera. All of these parameters need to be met. And if they if it goes down to 12.8 volts real quick, sorry, missed the, problem, missed the uh, step, and then it's going to cancel itself right out. So there are certain parameters the manufacturer needs to, and especially on like this one, the 2012 Nissan, that can be pretty finicky when it comes to that. Uh, so just learn, you know, you need to go through all the steps and follow the steps. Don't just breeze through and just keep hitting yes, 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 continue. So in this case, we hit continue. If all conditions are met, hit continue to start the test. And then it'll go through, test will in progress. It'll open and close and do what it needs to do. And then it'll say test is completed at the end. And it's okay. Now we get into where it gets a little gray. So coding is one of the things that even OEMs can confuse you with, oh, it's flashing, it's not flashing, it's coding, programming. Uh, so this can get a little confusing. But what coding is, by definition, it's used to teach the ECM parameters by using a code number. For example, if I replace a fuel injector on many vehicles, I need to teach the, the control module the flow rate of that fuel injector. So I would type in the number that's on the barcode on top of the injector or whatever that happens to be. Multiple manufacturers do it multiple different ways, but uh, maybe you have to type it in. Or proxy alignment, which is popular Fiat Chrysler vehicles, that's uh, where it actually takes coding from other modules and syncs everybody up on the bus. So that's, you don't necessarily have to type anything in, but it's like a copy and paste using the uh, scan tool. Next one's programming. So this is where it really gets confusing. I see out, out in the industry everywhere, OEMs, aftermarket tools, anywhere. They conflate programming with flashing, with reflashing. Oftentimes they, they just call it one and the same thing. And that's not truly what it is. When you talk programming, what you're doing is you're using the change the ECM parameters, but we're not flashing. So the examples is, uh, uh, this is very common inside, say, a body control module where I have a lot of different options. So for example, I want all the doors to unlock when I press the fob button once instead of just the driver's door. unlock. That would be an option that I could go in and I could change. I could program a different setting into that. Or I want the alarm to chirp when I click it or I don't. So this is an example on the body control module on my car. And you can see we got a lot of different uh, different things in there. Uh, for example, auto lock time. Maybe I want it to automatically lock after 20 seconds driving down the road instead of just no seconds. So all I'd have to do is go over here to hit edit. Now I don't have the next screen in here, but what it would show me is some options, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 seconds. Select from that menu, and then you'd hit program to program that into the vehicle. So now we get into the bulk of the presentation, the, the meat here that we're talking about, flashing or reflashing. You can hear that heard um, uh, many times. That those can often be used one and the same. And really, when you get down to it, it's essentially the same operation. So flashing is used to write software to the ECM. So this is really generates from flash wrong right so i can flash new software onto this chip is, is what that boils down to so i'm actually writing software to the ecm for example chrysler is notorious for this uh, a lot of other manufacturers will do this as well but i know just with my experience with chrysler anytime you'd order a module pretty much it would be blank there's nothing on it 
it's here's the chips and everything that we need, but we don't have any software on it. So you got to flash it yourself when you get it to match the vehicle. Otherwise, it just won't do anything because it won't have any software on there to run it anyway. Uh, so that would be, I would say, just a straight flashing. I'm flashing the software to the module. Now, in other cases, it might be for a TSB or maybe just to, at the end of an operation, you have to change the calibration file on the computer. And for lack of a better term, a calibration file is just a software revision. So I have a newer software revision than what's on there. So I'm reflashing. I'm writing the software back to the module. It just might have something different in it. For example, back when I worked for Subaru, there were a few different recalls and campaigns when it came to the uh, uh, catalytic converters. They were just going through catalytic converters like crazy, probably mid 2000s to late, you know, early 2010s. They were just going through cats like crazy. And a lot of it had to do with the mixture was so lean that it would just burn the cats out. So what they did is that they'd come in and, and you'd, uh, you'd do a couple things, go through the bulletin. And then the final operation was flash a new calibration file on the computer. So you would go through, pull the right cal file out, and you would send it down, and then, and then it would just write to the computer. So that's probably the easiest, simplest way to do it, because coming from the manufacturer, and the manufacturer says, here's your file, and it's ready to go, and you just, just do your thing, right? Uh, but that is a possibility of things that you might need to do out in the real world. Maybe it's a misfire problem, and a software calibration will fix that problem. Right. So sometimes that's the only way to fix it. Sometimes the only way to fix the problem is to replace the computer. And then I get a blank computer and then I need to flash software on the computer. So those would be the times where you really need to do that at the end, of course, um, somewhere, sometimes during the process of doing a diagnosis. But sometimes that's the only way to fix it is to just do it. Now, when it comes to flashing a vehicle, if you want to do this yourself, you can. There's Plenty of ways to go about this yourself. Uh, you will need some equipment. You're not going to be doing it with your scan tool. Um, pretty much any manufacturer that allows flashing using a J2534 box, which is pretty much all the manufacturers out there, um, they allow flashing using a pass-through device or J2534 box. J box, you may have heard it called too. It's all the same thing. Uh, ours is the pass-through Pro 4 at the time. Um, Pretty much anybody in the industry, except for a couple, they're all made by the same company anyway. Um, so ours is made by the same company. It's just that they just kind of had a lock on it for years. And we just, you know, we partner with them and they build it for us. It's easier that way. Um, so pretty much most boxes in the industry are going to be made by the same, made in the same place, made by the same manufacturer. Just got a different label on. And they're all pretty much the same price. So it's not like if you go direct, it's going to be any cheaper. Uh, also, a Windows computer, because I've not found a manufacturer that allows Mac OS. I've not found any manufacturers that do Linux. I haven't found any that do um, Android. So if you have an Android tablet type scan tool and they say they can flash, that's false. Maybe with the interface box is a J box, but you still need a computer to do it. So um, Windows based computer, and we'll see. Well, I'm going to walk through some specs from different manufacturers to see what you would need. Uh, you also need an internet connection. Some manufacturers have relaxed their requirements for it to be a wired internet connection because Wi-Fi has gotten a lot better in the in the last you know five ten years. But it used to be you had to be wired up with a network cable and everything. And then another very important thing that you a lot of people forget or skip or miss is you need a good power supply. So in this case is the uh, EEBC five hundred. Um, and that has a mode for flashing. So it's got a steady sine wave, steady power, no spikes, no bumps, no noise. It's a very clean power supply. Uh, you do have to make sure you have proper current as well. Um, BMW requires 80, 90, 100 amps now. Uh, it used to be less, but uh, the newest version of the EEBC 500 has enough current and more uh, to cover pretty much any manufacturer. And then once you have all that equipment, you like I said, you're going to need a laptop. You may need more than one in order to do it this way. And we'll see why here in a little bit. Then after that, after you have all your equipment, then you're going to need an account with the manufacturer in order to do that. Whatever manufacturer 
you happen to be working with. And here's pretty much all of them in North America. Um, so we see like Acura, it's $45 a day for access to Flash. Uh, and each Flash is included. So you can flash as many Acuras and Hondas as you want in one day using their software. Um, if you want to do General Motors, though, it's $45 per VIN, and you can flash it as many times as you want in a two-year period. So that's a totally different business model, right? So it's 45 bucks, and you can flash this vehicle as many times as you need to. So that's, that's not that bad. That's pretty comparable to a day rate, but you can do it over, the, you know, per VIN. So you wouldn't... What we used to tell people, because the manufacturers have changed their prices many times. I just I went and updated this table last block, last week, so I know it's current. But a lot of manufacturers, it used to be, oh yeah, it's like fifty bucks for three days. So I would say, you know, if you're gonna do Mazda, just pull in a bunch of Mazdas, have them all scheduled for that three day period, and just sit there and flash them all for the fifty bucks. Right, that makes sense. Uh, so most of them have day, month, and year plans. Uh, Audi Volkswagen is not. So that is uh, day or year, no monthly included there. Um, for Nissan, for example, uh, it says you have to just buy the software and install the software. Now, this NERS software is going away, and they're converting over to their uh, um, consult software. You can get consult now. Uh, but... That's for another couple of months. If we, if we pop in their uh, website a little bit later, we'll be able to see that that is still what they tell you they want you to do. Uh, let's see, Jaguar Land Rover, 180 bucks for a day, 800 bucks for a month, 2100 bucks for a year. Right? So it all varies depending on the vehicle. Um, oh yeah, for the $425 for the software for Nissan and Infiniti, it's also $29.95 per flash. So, you know, that's a thing. I remember you used to do Hyundai and Kia, it was free. You know, you download the software for free and any flashes the vehicle needed would just do it. So they've, they've gone on the, on the charging for stuff bandwagon. But yeah, hey, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but as you can see, it's very different from manufacturer to manufacturer, how long it is. Subaru is kind of the odd duck. And yeah, Subaru is just an odd duck to begin with. Uh, but it's $75 quarterly. As many flashes, you know, all the current flashes, they ship it to you on a disc. And then here's all the current flash files available for you know, any vehicle that we've made up until now or any of the flash current, whatever the current part number is for flashes up until then, it's $75 a quarter. Uh, so they just send it to you, you, install the software, and then you could. And this is all with that J2534 box, right? This isn't talking factory software. That's different. But if we look at these two columns, we can also see that diagnostics, the majority of manufacturers, at least in North America, uh, allow you to do dealer level diagnostics. Now you see a lot of them, it's 2018 and newer. And that stems from the Right to Repair Act. Um, that's not necessarily really an act, but um, it's it mandated 2018 and newer. They have to offer it. Anything older than that, they don't have to. So, for example, Ford's limited for 2017 and older. Chrysler's actually dealer level 07 and newer. Uh, and then we see what reflash capabilities they have. So 04 and newer, all modules excluding most network, all modules, ECM and TCM only. ECM and TCM with SCN coding for Mercedes, uh, right? So there's a lot of options available. Now, if I wanted to work, if I work on all makes, I got to have an account with all the makes. It means I need usernames and passwords with all of them, which means I need credit cards on file. With all. So it can be a bit of a pain. Luckily, there are other ways around this that we're going to talk about too. Um, and then when it comes to just the computer, I got to make sure I have the right computer and then the computer needs to be configured properly. So here's an example for four, right? Windows 10 Professional, uh, Internet Explorer 11 or Microsoft Edge, no Google Chrome, no Firefox, four gig or greater of RAM, and this is the minimum, 2.1 gigahertz greater, i5, i7. And also note, this was interesting to me, Windows 7 and 8.1 that updates to Windows 10 is not supported. So they want a clean, fresh install of Windows 10 Professional. Oh, by the way, no Windows 11. Can't do Windows 11 right now, not supported. And this is from last week. I sniffed this off their website. So, um, 10 professional 64 bit is what's recommended, 8 gig or greater, solid state hard drive, et cetera. So, that's all well and good if I want to do Ford, but what if I want to do Mazda? Oh, well, they don't play together on the same computer. Note Mazda MMP and Ford FMP cannot be installed on the same computer. You will need to uninstall one 
of them in order to use the other. So if I want to do Fords and Mazdas, I need either need two separate computers or I need to get good at um, partitioning hard drives and virtual machines and stuff. I don't even think virtual machines are acceptable. But, um, you know, partitioning hard drives and stuff and, and making sure things are separate, multiple instances of Windows and things. So it can get complicated. And that's just for Ford and Mazda, which are technically, aren't they kind of together? Same company in a way, yeah. So uh, here's from BMW. So BMW says, make sure you have a good power supply. A battery charger is not the same as a vehicle power supply. That's why you need a good charger like the one we had, I showed earlier. Um, Ethernet connection or internet connection, four megabits per second, upload of 400 kilobits per second. Uh, in order to carry out vehicle diagnosis, relevant workshop system must be connected via LAN cable with a bandwidth of at least 100 megabits per second. So, um, and then here's the hardware, what they want, 250 gigs of free hard drive space, USB 2.0. Operating system, Windows 10 Professional Enterprise, 64-bit, but I need 32-bit Java. So it's all these little things. And if one thing isn't right, it's not going to work. So it can get a little bit confusing. It can get be a little bit of a pain in the butt. That's why there are people out there that that's all they do. There's people out there that all they do is drive around in a car with a bunch of different laptops, and they flash cars for shops, which is great. Wonderful business model, because I'm sure... There's plenty of shops out there that don't want to get involved in that. And then there's other places you can get where you can get pre-configured computers as well. Out there, so you don't necessarily have to worry about it. So you, ha you have your J-Box, and then you buy a computer, and then you're all set. Uh, another example, this is from Ford again. So back-end server and IDS and FDRS issues may be caused by any of the following items listed below. It could be like Windows Firewall, Antivirus, Internet Explorer Configuration, .NET Framework version. All these different things can cause issues. These have to be trusted sites. There's a lot of configuring that needs to be done. This isn't to scare you off. I just need you to understand that there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of homework that needs to be done before you can just jump in and say, hey, I'm going to flash a car. And even then, you might not necessarily be successful. Here's an example that this happened to me last week. I, In preparation for this class, I wanted to go in and get, get at least one um, one account set up with Stellantis. Figured that might work, right? So I wanted to set it up through Stellantis. So I set up my Stellantis site. And then they say, okay, if you want to do flashing, then you need to go over to the Mopar Technical Service Portal and set up a separate account over there. And then when I did that, I couldn't finish it. You want to know why? Because their website is broken. Maybe it's fixed now, but last week it was not. And this is the type of stuff you're going to run into. Uh, so I went through the whole, there was a whole form up above this where you put, you know, a name and address and all that good stuff. And then it hit register and it gives me this error. And it says, please check reCAPTCHA box. And I said, well, where's the reCAPTCHA box? Sure looks like it's supposed to be right here. You know, the little check box you check to say I'm not a robot. Not there. Just not there. So, don't know. Can't get an account. Can't get to my flash files. Can't do the YTech subscription. Can't do any of that because I can't get in here. Kind of interesting. And I will tell you that as par for the course in my experience with Stellantis, FCA, Daimler, Chrysler, whatever you want to call them, even way back. Sometimes the flash files weren't correct. Sometimes you go and find the flash file and it downloads the wrong one. Seen that happen enough times. It even happens with the factory tool where it doesn't always work correctly. So your mileage may vary. And that's why there's people out there that have jobs to do this and that's their business model and that's wonderful uh there also is another piece of hardware you could grab too it's called a pass-through assistant this is our our version of this once again there's a couple of them out there um the thing is with the pass-through assistant though as far as pass-through flashing type activities uh these are the manufacturers that are covered and you notice it's not all of them there's some missing uh and that's just because of licensing agreements with those particular manufacturers not wanting them to be able to do this flashing over the internet, which is basically what you're doing. Um, so that is an option if one of those manufacturers or any of these manufacturers are ones that you would need access to. There is another wrench that gets thrown in here too, and that's when it comes to security. Now, I'm not just talking keys. I'm not just talking immobilizers. 
I'm talking even some modules in the vehicle, you need this vehicle security access, vehicle security professional access. Now, not everybody can get that. Not everybody can afford that to do that. So what they have now is they have assisted immobilizer repro. This is a group of NASTF vetted service providers. NASTF is the National Automotive Service Task Force. And they have vetted service providers, which the folks who provide the service for the pastor assistant are. Uh, so you actually go through and, and somebody in the shop has to have this. They'll do a background check. It's like a light vehicle service professional. That way they can confirm that somebody authorized is working on the vehicle. So that's just another thing that needs to get done if you're going to do this. And we found that out pretty quick, too. It was like, oh, we can't complete this because we can't do that. And then actually NASTIF, we worked with NASTIF to come up with this. So um, very helpful for those who need it. And like I said, it, it's a it's a phone call appointment type thing. You plug in and hook up the tool and they do the rest on the other side of the phone. So it works pretty slick, um, limited to manufacturers and that's just because of it. But coming soon to this pastor assistant, if you already have a pastor assistant, which there's plenty of them out there, or if you get a new pastor assistant in the coming months, uh, we are adding another feature to this, not just the pastor assist programming, but also repair guidance. Because what came about as we started putting these out there in shop was that we discover oftentimes shops would call in, say, hey, I need a flash. And then they go to look for it and it doesn't need a flash. It's something else that it needs that maybe the, the the person calling in doesn't know that it needs. So we have OE trained brand specific master techs on the other end of the phone that are able to give you repair guidance when needed. Uh, so it's interactive support and you just, you would call in and they, uh, you can get there through flashing. So say I wanted a flash and they say, Oh, a flash actually won't help this problem or the, the vehicle doesn't need it. It let's look at this, this, and this you know, go through an actual diagnostic from a factory trained technician. So that is coming very soon, like next month. I just figured we're talking about it right now. Might as well make you aware of it. And you'll also notice that larger number of manufacturers are available. So these are basically the factory tool here. Um, they can actually go through and hook, to, hook up to it if necessary. Otherwise, if you do have a snap-on tool, they can walk you through how to do functions if available on the snap-on tool as well. Uh, in order to walk through. So, uh, pretty cool added feature. Like I said, if you already have a pass-through assist, it'll come as an update at some point in the next couple months. Uh, and then uh, like any new ones sold in the next, starting in the like, next month, uh, that will be you know, available to you right away. All right. So let's go live real quick and just look at a few resources that can also help you when it comes to this. Here. Right. So I'm just going to go to our diagnostics website, diagnostics.snapon.com. And we see here, we even have a quick link right to pastor assistance there. So I can click on that. And that will bring us to the pastor assistance, a little walkthrough video talks about how it works. We go down to resource center here. There's actually a customer agreement that you need to activate before they can do the uh, do the do the flash programming. So you just need to basically sign this, uh, put in the billing information, etc. With that, and then over here, if you're wondering what all is available to be done with the pastor assist, there's a capabilities and cost document that just got updated at the beginning of the year, first of January, and it pulls up so. I had that open from before. But so you can see, you know, Chrysler Deep jo Jeep Dodge Ram Plymouth. I uh, need an answer. Is blah, 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 four digit security pin needed for a mobilizer? Um, and it tells you what it covers. Oh, wait, newer um, modules and systems that are covered. J2534 module programming, key programming, and associated configuration setup and security functions are $149 per module. Plus thirty dollar fee for FCA for the OE subscription. Um, calibration checks fifty bucks, so that's pretty much all of them across the board. There's a couple like FCA that have a extra additional fee. Um, 
$45 per VIN field would charge for any security related modules that require that NASDAQ SDRM registration. Customers have their own, will not be required to pay for it. But if you have that thing uh, that we talked about, the assisted programming, then you would need to pay an extra $45 for that. Now, all this pretty much just gets passed on to the customer. Uh, $149, $50 for a check. GM, same deal. On to Acura, they actually give you a chart as to what's capable, 07 and newer, pretty much everything. Uh, Hyundai, that uh, gives you your ranges there. So this doesn't even come up to, uh, this goes up to 1819. Let's see, Kia, same deal, of course. Mercedes, notice how it says currently unavailable pending manufacturer discussions. So uh, this is one of the ones where it's a manufacturer licensing thing where they don't want us doing it. So um, it's on hold for now. And that's, like I said, not from us. It's from the manufacturer. So uh, Nissan Infinity, Toyota Lexus, et, et cetera. So you, could, you can go through this on your own if you'd wish uh, to be able to see that. Also in here, if we go to just the general pass-through section, this gives us the pass-through system where we just were and the pass-through Pro 4. Now, there's pass-through pro drivers for the box. So if you need to reinstall drivers, get new drivers, you can do that and install it. It won't really do anything until you have the box hooked up to your computer, but you can at least download the drivers. And then OEM links will give you links to the manufacturer's respective websites. All right, so for example, and then once again, this is for North America, um, Europe, Australia, different sites. Uh, for example, Nissan. And I'll just go here. Uh, J2534 programming. And then we see here, here's Nurse. Uh, so NERS will sunset on August 31st, 2024. So you got a few more months, uh, but it was just updated a couple weeks ago. So they are still updating it, but it's 425 bucks. Then after that, then you need to download uh, the flash files as well. So just so you're aware, um, that is going away and then it just ends up being consult, I think, actually. But um, that's just Nissan's example. If I go and go to like Kia, uh, you need a login for that. Uh, J2534, though, I can click on that. Uh, reprogramming. All right, and then it tells us valid devices, which are to be basically a Cardac 3 or Cardac Plus. Um, software and hardware identification. So it gives you all the information, but once again, every manufacturer is different. Every manufacturer's process is different. Every manufacturer's subscription fee is different. And that's why not everybody wants to do it, but you can, you can absolutely do it. Um, as long as you're willing to do the homework and read up and, and do what you need to do with the computer and make sure everything's configured properly, you can do this. Other people, like I said, they'll just send it off to the, the guy that comes in off the road, and that's perfectly fine as well. Or they have the pass-through assistant as an option as well. So a lot of options out there when it comes to flashing. Um, a lot of people say, well, why don't you do a class on flashing? This is pretty much the class I can do on flashing and reflashing because everything changes so often. And every manufacturer is different. So I'd have to do one on Ford, one on Chevy, one on Mercedes, one on BMW, one on Volkswagen. I'd have to do all different ones because it's never the same procedure depending on the manufacturer. So that's really why there's a lot of nuances and ins and outs to it. So hopefully at least I gave you a good overview of kind of what's going on with it and you know, maybe whet your appetite and maybe you do want to dive on it. Maybe you want to get some assistance with that. Either way is fine. I just wanted to, uh, hopefully I educated you a little bit more on the ins and outs of that. And with that, that is our time here today. So uh, make sure you tune in for new diagnostic content every week. We will be premiering a new video every Wednesday at 7 p.m. UK time. So make sure you check it out on the YouTube channel. If you're watching, well, of course, you would be watching this on YouTube, but make sure you subscribe, thumbs up, uh, ring a little notification bell so you know anytime we post new content. And it's youtube.com slash snap on diagnostics UK. With that, time for questions. If you have any questions, just feel free. Once again, if you're watching this on a premiere, just leave it in the live chat and we'll answer those. Otherwise, uh, leave a comment under the video and we will get to those uh, as we monitor those comments as well.
So I'd like to thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day to learning a little bit more about how you might be able to be more efficient at diagnosing vehicles using some of the information that we've given you today. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Hopefully you can watch uh, and see you on any of our other videos. Have a good week, have a good night, and take care.